Delta. An American. That's your top 10 class. <laughs> <laughs> top 10. No, that would be weapons school. I'm not a weapons school. I'm a test pilot school graduate. There's a, a very small number go to test pilot school, and then a, another larger, a little bit larger number go to weapons school. Uh, they're, they're like weapons school are the mission guys. The test guys are just the guys who can land and trim really well. That's about all we can do. We can land. You, you tell, land there. I can land right there on speed every time. That's, that's my skill. That's the only skill I have. So everything else is kind of up for grabs. So you can land on the enemy. I can land on the enemy. No, no, that's for performance testing, right? For performance. You got to get the performance. Yeah, it's not so much the enemy as getting the what equipment. The equipment, right? I guess I can put bombs where they tell me to. But that's another thing. All right. So we, are, we got John again. And uh, I don't like to go back and review because there's so much good stuff. But... You have them there, you can pick up the notes. We, we already did Nicodemus, and I did not do it yet because I was uh, helping set up stuff. Uh, but I've got to do, I'll do a synopsis of the third chapter for you. I'll probably have time. Uh, and when I do that, I'll present it to you like I have the other ones. Because I think the synopsis, <clears throat> you know, you know how... I'm really upset when people pull stuff out of context because everything you pull out of, of the New Testament is out of context. It has to be part of the Logos to tell us. So what we do is we tend to not look at it that way, which is really sad because this third chapter is not just about Nicodemus and about John and about this stuff and these sayings like the saying we have here, you know. It is, it is much more than that. It's a total cohesive logos to tell us that sometimes, and by the way, have you noticed John has actually been giving us some telai. He's giving us a telos, which should be like astounding to us because he's like, well, who is this guy? Is this guy really a Greek? No, I told you at the beginning. This guy is more like a Roman, and he's, I think he's writing to Romans. And he's also, of course, his audience is the Jewish Christians. But because I think he's so tight with the Romans, that's why when we read it, he's got all these funny euphemistic things that sometimes aren't that euphemistic. And we go, wow, and then he tells us conclusions. And we go, well, none of the other guys gave us any conclusions. They just kind of left us, you know, floating on our own. So... You know, I, I think that's what really makes it astounding. I will mention this last one because we saw this is approaching the end of the chapter and the end of that, that uh, thing with John. I remind you, John was baptizing with his disciples, and they said there was a dispute with a Judean, with a Judean and we said, well, which Judean? Was it Nicodemus? Was it Jesus? Who's the Nic he was this Judean that everybody knew about, but we don't right? So knowledgeable. Well, I said it probably could have been Nicodemus. The dispute was about cleanliness and about purity and about whether the mitzvah would purify. So very interesting. You know, we, we talked about it, had some conclusions, and then we kind of get to the end and we have this statement by John that, and you know, you can read it in your own thing, but 330 this is a translation in the Greek, that one thing it is necessary to grow, but me to lessen. And this, again, I won't go back over the thing, but this was the one thing. It's not Jesus. It's John's char, his cheerfulness. His, and then we get a telos. And this is a telos directly from this, which is a beautiful telos. Okay, here's what it says in the NIV. We know that we, we've got to recheck all of our, our, our uh, Greek, but we will. And I mean, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. Okay. You know, now we in our euphemistic English thinking go, well, yeah, I kind of can make sense of that. But what does it really say, right? Here's the old Greek stuff, but let's go look at the, you know, we look at the King James and then see what, what the Greek literally says. 
He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Now, there was a little bit that John kind of precursored this or, or pre-did this, but here's what it says in the Greek. Be from above, ekthomeos, coming or going, apano, up above, panton, of all or the whole, that's that pass, estin is, and here we got an estin, we actually have an identity form, the own, being, the being, another identity form, from out or from among, of the, of the soil. From out or among of the of the soil. That's where they get this of the earthly. But you notice they turn earthly into a, a, a adverb or, an, or into an adverb. Utters words, Layla, utters words, the from out or from among, of the of a sky, of the dwelling place of the gods who are not God, that was coming or going up above of all or the whole is. Okay. We gotta be able to put this into English context, right? So here's what the English direct literal is of the Greek. That coming from above is up above everything. This is a very concrete statement. And you say, well, that's obvious, right? Maybe not so much. We can talk about that, but that coming from above is up above everything. What does that connote? They're, yeah, up here on us. Yeah, up here on us. Because that coming from above is up above everything. Up here on us. Not just the Uranus. Not just what I perceive or see, but the up here on us. That being from out of the soil is from out of the soil. And utters words from out of the soil. Utters words from out of the soil. Now we would say, what is the soil? Literally, that means from the earth, right? And again, we say, well, this is Captain Obvious. Well, it may not be so Captain Obvious. Because remember his previous statements, John's previous statements, and Christ's previous statements about the Christ. Did the Christ come from the sky? No, he was born physically into the gate, into the soil, into the earth. So therefore, he speaks from the earth. And it's not like he came down like an angel or a god or something like that. He was born into the earth. And not only that, he created everything, right? He created the soil. So, you know, yeah, you can play the euphemistic card on this, but look what the euphemistic card, this is an irony, a satire, if you like, right? Because if we're talking about, if we're talking about Jesus, out of the soil, from out of the soil, and others words from out of the soil, because he made it. He made it all, right? I mean, this is really cool stuff. And then it goes on. That coming from out of the sky is up above everything. Interesting. And you say, why does he make this statement? This is about, this is about, the power of Christ, and this is a telos, it's a telos based on his overall statement. What was the original, the very beginning thing that John wanted to tell, John the gospel writer, what was his whole point about everything? He put it right up front. He said, Jesus is God. And so, I, you know, if you are going to prove that point, how do you prove that point? Now, from a Greek standpoint, you do it through logic, through logos, through an argument, right? How do the Romans do it? Force. Yeah, force. <laughs> force. They demonstrate. They, they demonstrate. Yeah, they want a demonstration. They're the show me state, right? Like misery. In misery, the show me state. Show me. I want to see, right? Prove it to me. You know, that's like the empiricists. The empiricists. Romans are empiricists. <laughs> We can't help it. As a matter of fact, uh, we can't help it because the empiricists won. You knew that. This is something they don't teach it, that they ought to teach it, because this is the whole thing about civilization. You guys heard the um, let's see, what do we call that? The age of uh, the age of enlightenment, right? The age of enlightenment occurred because the empiricists won. 
and the logisticians lost because the age of enlightenment comes out of the age of reason. And what was the big fight in the age of reason? The big fight was between empiricism and reason. The reason guys said, I can prove everything through reason and mathematics, because mathematics is not based in concrete empiricism. I hope you know that, especially after being in this class, but it's absolutely the most factual thing you'll ever hear. The empiricist said, oh no, you have to prove it with scientific method and through science. You have to prove it. Therefore, we entered the age of enlightenment and we have guys like Thomas Jefferson. What was Jefferson's problem? All the other founding fathers didn't have this problem. Jefferson seemed to have the problem. He was a pure empiricist. He said what? Miracles of Christ, superstition, supernatural. It's not empirical, I don't believe it. So he actually made a Bible that he cut it all out. He cut all the miracles out. And, and the Jefferson Bible is New Testament with no miracles. Not necessarily true. What's that? He wrote that Bible to train the Indians. And the Indians had trouble with miracles, so he left them out of the Bible. He made a version of the Bible. I haven't heard that expressed before. Um, I've always heard that he, you know, he, he's not really a deist per se. Although they try to portray him and other founding fathers as deists, but that makes even uh, I, I don't know I, I've not heard I've seen that documented. But the thing I have seen documented is you know that he did pull the miracles out. And I haven't heard that either before because the uh, Indians really were super spiritual and super uh, supernatural. You know that's kind of a stretch. I think. I'm sorry. If you find a source, I'd appreciate it because yeah. But the thing is, that, you know, Indians, uh, the Indian uh, were animus. In animus, uh, they, animism, everything is a spirit, right? The trees are spirits. You ever want, right? What do you know about Indians and Indian ideas, right, and spirituality? What did you have to do to prove your manhood? You had to go into a fit and work yourself into a thing. And many times the young men never returned because they died in the mountains, finding the spiritual reality in their spiritual self, right? So I'm not so sure. I think they were really driven by miracles. That's okay. We don't have to dwell on that. Um, anyway, this is kind of a comp – go ahead, Pat. Question being, from a purely logical standpoint, there's a problem here. It's kind of a paradox because you can't come from that which you created. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, basically, is kind of a, the problem. So if you created the soil – I mean, to the Greek mind, obviously, we know that both are true at the same time, even though they don't appear to be. But from the Greek mindset, that must have been a problem. It's like, well, if he created the earth and all things, then how did he come from the earth? So, yeah. I, you know, anything that you point out or see as a, either satire or irony is perfect. Because you know how much the Greeks like logic, reasoning, and the thing that really threw them off, and by the way, the thing that created the Mysterions, was in the Mysterions, they saw things that they could not explain through spirits. And they unfortunately didn't have the science or the, you know, we, we have the science and science of human that we say, well, fire is not a spirit, it's a natural force. But they could not answer that question. But they saw things like pi, they saw things like, um, uh, like pi, like what's the other big one? Oh, the Pythagorean <laughs> theorem. Euclid and all that. Geometry. Yeah, geometry. They, uh, Zeno, 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 right? The Zeno's paradox. I can walk halfway down, another halfway, another halfway. Can I, can I ever reach the door, right? And but yes, you can. It's mathematically possible, but it requires higher level math. And they had actually figured out some of this geometrically where later on, who is the guy that figured out the answer to Zeno's paradox mathematically? Isaac Newton. Because Isaac Newton invented calculus and um, integral calculus and differential calculus. Anyway, <laughs> these these are important stuff, right, in the world. I, I think this is wonderful. It's how we can build airplanes. But anyway, um, so what we see in paradox is Whenever the Greeks saw something that was paradoxical or, or seemed different, right, they, they wanted, that was something they wanted to, 
wanted to, they brought it to the point of mysterion. They brought it to the point of, come on, wake up. Um, they wanted to bring it to the point of worship because they saw that, you know, if there were not spirits, they would have to be some natural force in the world that what, what's the only thing they could call them? Gods, right? Pi. What is Pi? They never, the Mysterians never called it God, but yet the, the Mysterion was part of Osiris, the god Osiris. The Mithrin <coughs> Mysterion was part of Mithras, a god. So if, if you don't have the physical or the knowledge, you, you're only, you can only fit into one thing, right? You're set in one thing. Anyway, um, I think this is really interesting. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. And you notice this must fit into this previous verse. <clears throat> the he, the he is Christ. The up above everything, that being out of the soil, has got to be Christ. That coming from out of the sky is up above everything. In other words, Christ is both, yeah, both, right? And, and the, Greeks, the Greeks would probably not say that's an irony. They would probably say that's not really an irony. He's God, right? But yet their gods are stuck where? Their gods are stuck on the earth and in the Oranos. Humans are stuck on the earth, on the gay. So you have a god a being who is in, above the Epiaranos, or is in the Epiaranos, above the skies, and also in the skies, and also in the earth. This, <laughs> you know, oh yeah, John is just a simple, that's a really simple gospel, and that guy is just a simple guy, he wasn't very bright, right? Eh, I don't know, this, you, talk, you said Euclid, this is kind of pushing way past the edge of Euclid in some ways, right? And he that has seen and heard that he testified that no man receiveth his testimony. Uh, the he has stared at, Erokin, and Ekosin has heard this, Matea. He bears witness who testifies, and the evidence and evidence, Matean, of him, not even one, Lambani. Lambani takes hold of. I love this. Lambani never means receive in Greek, it always means to take hold of. It means to grasp with a grasp firmly. He bears witness to that which he has stared at and has heard, and not even one takes hold of his evidence given. Now, you know, this seems really similar or really close to what it is here, but what's the context of this verse, of the context of this statement? I like these word verse, his statement. What does he bear witness to? Yeah, from above the sky, and he bears witness to what is in the soil, in the gay, right? He bears witness to everything. As a matter of fact, okay, who's in the beginning of this chapter? Good old Nicodemus, right? And Jesus told good old Nicodemus, what? You are the rabbi of Israel, but you don't understand? Right? That's what he said to him. You're the rabbi, but you don't understand. Because Jesus told him, and what did he tell him? What was the big deal about this whole chapter? The, this telos goes right back to the big deal of this chapter. It's about the pneuma. The fact that the pneuma is in everyone, the Greek worldview of the pneuma. Therefore, you're not like, you're, you're not. Pharisee, and the Pharisees say, you ain't got no panuma, you just got breath, and you're going to be resurrected physically. The Sadducees say, you ain't got no panuma, you just got breath and body, and are you going to be resurrected? Yeah. Nope, you just go back to the soil, if something happens to your breath, you're, no, pfft, you're done, right? So Jesus was telling them that, yeah, there has got to be panuma, and he was proving to them about the panuma. 
And not only just about the Panuma, then we have the Hagios Panuma. So the Panuma is not just something that gets thrown on a man or a woman that allows them to prophesy. That's the Hagios Panuma. Instead, he's telling them that, hey, you always have the Panuma. You don't always have the Hagios Panuma. You see, the, you see this difference? And so... What happens? We get confused because we get to the end of John. And what happens at the end of John, the beginning of Luke? What gets, what gets given to the Christians? Oh, the, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit. But what does Jesus say about every human soul? You don't have the Holy Spirit, but you have a pneuma. That's the message of John, at least the third chapter of John. That's the whole point. That's what this conclusion is. And so we, what he's saying is, what does he bear witness to? The Spirit. And what has he heard? Remember, it's a tone, a sound. The sound of the bridegroom and the bride. Right? The beauty, the cheer, the caris. These are... Very powerful statements. Whoever is accepted is certified that God is truthful. This is a very interesting statement. He that received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. So what's it say? The Laban, the taken hold of, the Laban, the Laban, the having taken hold of, of his, the materian and evidence, epfastigian, whatever, he is stamped for security or preservation, sealed. That or because the theos is not false is. Who, he who having taken hold of his evidence given, he who having taken hold of his evidence given, has stamped for security that God is not false. Wow. This is a telos, telic based statement where John is repeating from what we heard in the whole Nicodemus episode. So therefore, take hold of the evidence given, which means what? Usins and us, right? We're all, we have to take hold of the evidence. That it's like, stamping for security is very interesting. Because who could stamp for security? We don't do what the Japanese do. Do you know the Japanese, every family has a seal. The seal is usually the first kanji letters of their name, but it can be the, it can be other than kanji. It can be the whatever the other type. But it's never romanji, but it's always on a seal. And I bought one when I was in Japan. Although there is no A symbol, I try to get something close. But anyway, whenever they get a package in the mail, they're required by Japanese law to stamp the certificate that says they got it. I don't know if they had problems in the past or if it was just their culture, their thing, but they they want to ensure that the package was received. And when you put your seal on it, that seal says that was received. In the ancient world, we know that they had signet ring. Signet ring. I, this is almost a signet ring. I have I have a, a signet from uh, Poseidon uh, or, or Apollo or something. That I got in Greece that was an actual reproduction of a signet from a ring. But a signet ring was a seal. And so when you sealed it, it identified you as the person sealing usually a message. Do you have a comment there? Oh, just it's it's the analog to our signature when we sign the document. Now. Right. It's, it's proof that you witnessed the document itself. Yeah, and like you have to do a notary too. I bet it, you know, sometimes they make you do a notary. What a painful existence that is, you know. Uh, sometimes they do it for free. Sometimes you pay money, but it's like, so, I don't know. Back when I was an officer in the Air Force, you know, an officer is a, is a it can be a notary. Although most, you know, you, you have to fight a battle if you want to make it stick. But literally, that's an official, a, an appointed official of the U.S. government is an automatic notary by law. 
So anyway, but you know, you have to go to a notary, a person who has a thing, and they have a seal, and they have to fill out the forms correctly and say they notarize your signature. But back in the good old days, you didn't do that. You said your signature and your seal, right? But what's really beautiful about this, this is totally concrete. Okay, yeah, it's got a euphemistic kind of point, right? The stamp of the seal for security, but they mean it in a concrete sense. So if you've taken hold of his evidence, you stamp for security that God is not false. What he's telling you is that, remember what I showed you in the picture? When you draw the picture, oh, look, there's a color. Um, you know, we have the plenum of everything. The plenum of everything is what? Is it physical? Is it spiritual? Yeah, it's all that. But but it's spiritual. And, and you know, before the creation, it, all of it is, if you want, it's all energy. Right? All of it's energy. And the energy that we're talking about is spiritual, supernatural energy. That's what it is. And then when I created, I, when God created the cosmos, right, that's the creation. The creation is energy, but it includes both physical matter, and it also, it, wait, wait. God divided the light and the darkness. God divided, you know, in the creation. Wait, wait, could he have been dividing the matter? From the energy and making the matter, you know? And then, did he divide the supernatural, the spiritual? No, the spiritual pervades everything, right? Energy pervades everything, whatever you want to call that. And then, the creation of the philosophia. The philosophia is what, what humans have the capability of knowing. And then within that, the creation of the gay. The gay being the Uranus. Not the epiuranos, it's the epiuranos, but the gay includes all physical stuff, all the empirical stuff. Is that little? That's really a tiny part of all of the plenum of everything and of creation. And so therefore, therefore, God is not false because the spirit exists. If the spirit, the pneuma, exists, that means the panuma is what? The resounding power of the entire universe. I'm not making this up. This is basically what we know from Greek, uh, what do you call this? Etymology, cosmology, not cosmetology, but cos cosmology, right? So it's, you know, Greek cosmetology. I don't think they quite invented makeup yet. The, the Egyptians did that. But you see what this is. This is telling us stuff, and, you know, we go back to that statement about, you know, the, the sky is above all, la, la, la. You know, why is that not an obvious statement? It's not as obvious as you think, because if we're talking about defining, defining, right? Defining what? A logical argument. Therefore, if I define a logical argument, I have the def definitions. I have assumptions, and then I make arguments that have some conclusion, right? A equals B, B equals C, therefore A must equal C. These are basic logical arguments. And you say, well, this isn't a basic logical argument. No, this is for the advanced, right? And we're supposed to be the advanced. So the other stuff we should have learned. Yes, sir? So I need some definition of the he and the his. I mean, one way you could read that is he, whoever is re reading this and listening to what Jesus said, has taken hold of Jesus' evidence and therefore has stamped for security that God is not false. So if you believe what Jesus has said, his evidence, then you stamp as not false that Jesus is God. That's a great question because, see, we can find this, the Greek grammar tells us the answer to that very easily. You notice what they did is instead of using he, which would be alto, instead of using the, um, the, uh, uh, the pronoun, you know, the, the, the direct pronoun in the Greek, they used the. 
and the pronoun is taken from the verb. So, labon is a verb that takes a he pronoun. And it's, and I don't think it's, let's see, we can look and see if it's, if it's plural. I don't think it's plural. It would be they, but we can look to see. Here's the Greek and the parts of speech. So we have a, a singular nominative masculine, single nominative to masculine, and it's not one, it's the article. Articles in Greek can be masculine, neutrum, and, well, I don't think they do, no, they don't do neutrum, masculine or feminine, that's it. And so in Greek, you have the masculine uh, singular, po, v, and this is, you notice, the verb is masculine singular. And it's in his uh, uh, nominative, nominative case. So this is the subject. The subject is the having received auto. Okay, this is genitive, so it's a possessive, masculine, third person singular, his. So it's saying generically, generic he, a generic he. And that's why it doesn't use a directed pronoun. So it means general, right? A general he. And of course, why does it say he? Because that's the <coughs> Greek language, okay? It's not trying to diss the ladies. It's just, it's like in German or any other language where you have the he generally connotes the overall population. Just like, I, I just have, what's that? The one hearing this argument. The one hearing this argument. I just want to mention this because it's so wonderful. You know, in German, you have man and you have man. What's the difference? First one should have two ends, but... <laughs> um, does it? I don't... Does it have two ends? I thought it just had one, but this is der Mann, and this is not der, die, or das. A person. This is just a person. So in, in German, you have an a actual word that means a person, but it is not considered... It, well, it's, it's not a noun... It is a noun, but it's not a noun case. It is a pronoun for a just a human, a general human. It can be a woman. It can be a woman, it can be a kid, it can be anything. Mankind. Mankind. Yeah, yeah we need that kind of word, right? We kind of have them, but you know, whatever the wolf is uh, trying to get rid of our word. Hmm. Anyway, I had to point that out. So, yes, we can see in the Greek that this means generically the he, anyone. Any you could even say anyone. Although they would use, if they meant that specifically, there is a uh, pronoun they use for anyone. Um, his, te his martyr of testimony has set his seal. It's really cool that he uses this word, right? He has set his seal um, that God, and they always have the God, the God. I take out the the usually in most cases, but it's always the God, <laughs> masculine, nom nominative, singular. So... God is the subject. True, not false. Aletheos means not false is. And it's really cool that they use, they, they, they didn't have to put this in. He didn't have to put Eston in, in the Greek, to make it grammatically correct. But he did anyway, to make it make sure you did not miss that it's identity. Yes, sir, do you have a question or a comment? Anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is kind of what I go through in the Greek, so I'm sorry. I'm making you guys feel the pain. So the his, actually, in this case, is not a future chapter, right? Um, yes. Well, if I do do that sometimes, and you're right. I probably should capitalize it because it refers directly back to God. But the reason I don't capitalize some of this stuff is because, number one, are there any caps in the Greek? No, there's no caps in the Greek. If you have you have majuscule and minuscule. Minuscule is all smalls, small letters, and you have majuscules, which is all caps. And they went through a period before they started using, I don't think the Greek ever used capitalism or cap, capitals to <laughs> to to uh, express any kind of grammatical things. I don't think What about sales? What's that? 
about Theo right there on the board? That uh, has a capital, right? Well, what they did, no, they did not write a cap. There are no capitals. What, what our translators have done for us, or not translators, what our Greek scholars have done for us is they took Theos and they put it in caps. But in the Greek, it never would be. And they also did something else. They gave us spaces. And there is no spaces in the Greek. They, they also gave us, uh, in modern Greek, what, do you see the other thing they gave us? They gave us um, the marks. These, these marks, th there are two reasons for these marks. You don't find, you find some of them in ancient Greek. You don't find the others. The accent marks that mean the pronunciation parts are not in ancient Greek. That's a modern Greekism. But the Daniel Lewis, that's cool. That helps you understand how to pronounce it. But you know how they wrote it in the early documents? They didn't write, okay, we have, let's see, um, oh man, my brain is hurt how to do it. <coughs> uh, uh, just a small, this is TH, so um, Theos, and that's uh, trailing. So they would not have written it like this, they would have written it like this. Can you guys see this? They were written like this. With no vowels. Right? Modern Orthodox Jews write God. They don't write this. They write this. So not with the dashes is what's in the original Greek. <coughs> yes. America, I showed you the original Greek in the early class. If you go back in class one or something, I usually provide the manuscripts. And you can see that in most most early Christian manuscripts, the earliest Christian manuscripts, they leave out the vowels in Christus, they leave out the vowels in, in uh, Theos, they leave out the vowels in many of them. In Holy Spirit, I don't think they ever leave out the vowels in the Holy Spirit, Hagios Pneuma, but they leave it out in both when they speak about God and Jesus. Christian thing or a Hebrew culture thing is coming into the Greek that they wouldn't have done that otherwise of spelling their own God's names. It's it's a Hebrew culture thing coming into the Greek, but we believe that the Hebrew uh, Hebrew scholars did that anyway when they wrote Greek. So it, and and they do it when they write English, right? So why wouldn't they do it when they write Greek? For instance, when they write Zeus, they wouldn't write Z blank blank S for Zeus, would they? Well, they never would do that. Right. They would have written, written Zeus because they did not see Zeus as a god like God. Uh, the second commandment, no, the second, <laughs> the second <laughs> commandment, right, says make no graven image. And they believe in, no, in the well, speak not. not <laughs> Wait, well, yeah, which number, right? Which one do you use? Right, so, if you use the more evangelical Protestant or the Catholic Lutheran. But forget that. Use the one that says, Thou shalt not say the name of God. They believe you should not write the name of God. So they would they would take out. That's why Adonai, they don't say, Yahweh is not written down, and especially not with vowel pointers. You write Yahweh in consonants and get away with it. But you're not supposed to say it to get in real trouble. So they use Adonai. Adonai is the vowels from Yahweh. <laughs> They still didn't like to say that either. And, and so they put, they, don't, they do the same thing. They put the sounds, the vowel sounds, with dashes. So anybody else, someone else had a comment or something that was pertinent? Because this is really, this disproves all the Brown, okay? Brown is an idiot. You can quote me. This disproves everything he said because what did he say? He said the early church did not see Jesus as God. But if you... If you're writing Theos with dashes, that means you, Theos is God in the, in the Greek and the Hebrew sense. And the earliest documents show that. And if you take the vowels out of Christus, you are doing what? God. You're saying he's God. And by the way, did you notice, what is John all about? That Jesus is God. That's what the whole book is about. Jesus is God. Just just remember that. I mean, it's like, that's what he tells you, right? In the beginning was God, and the 
Logos was with God. It's a direct quote from the Septuagint. So, anyway, this stuff is so intermeshed and so beautiful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This looks like some good stuff, right? For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. All right, you might be able to already figure this out, but let's see what the Greek says. He whom Gar, son of reason, epistilian, has he set apart the theos, the rema, and utterance. You notice we've used lelo, uh, logos, we've got rema, so we've used three of the Greek words for saying so we use epo too, we got epo in there. And we, of the theo of God, lelai, lelai, utters words. No or not, assigning a reason from out or among, metro, and measure. He gives the pneuma. Okay. Hmm. This is really interesting. Assigning a reason. He whom God has set apart speaks the utterance of God. Assigning a reason not from out of a measure, God gives the conscious breath. What does this just say? What does this just tell you? We're not talking about the Hagios Pneuma. In other words, okay, first of all, let's parse it. The signing reason whom God sets apart speaks the utterance of God. Therefore, who is this? Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. He, when he opens his mouth, he is uttering the words of God. He speaks the words of God. But you knew that, because he's the Logos. And the Logos is the command word of God that created the universe. So you knew that. Assigning a reason, not from out of a measure, God gives the conscious breath. What does that mean? It means when he created you, he didn't take from his lump of, of Panuma and go, Oh, here you go. You get some, and you get some. Oh, and you get a little more. And you get a little, little bit. Oh. Just a little bit. Okay. You, get, you get a little bit. No, he says what? He, he gave it all. And why? Because if we go back to our picture here, what has to be a characteristic of, a, of the human being? It must have spirit. Because if it doesn't have spirit, it can't be eternal. If it's not eternal, it's not in the image of God. If it's not in the image of God, well, that's the whole point of creation. Yes, sir. So it was a different breath that the animals got. A different breath than the animals got to receive. Ah, no. Animals. In the in, uh, I probably should put that in here, but if you remember back in Genesis, go back and look at your <coughs> Genesis. It says that when God created Adam, He made man out of Adam, which is mud, a uh, red dirt. And then it says that he placed nefesh into his nostrils. But then it goes on to say, we create man in our image. Singular God, or singular verb um, in the Hebrew, but a Elohim, God's created in our image. And it, uses, it does use the plural um, uh, preposition of, uh, Personal, uh, what do you call it? Preposition. No. A generic, a gener um, a, pot, a possessive pre preposition. In our image. So we created man in our image. Well, what is the image of God? He's spirit. Right? Ultimately, he's energy, but he's spirit. He is that being who is everything, but yet who is God. Right? Who is the God. And so... What the Greek or what the Hebrews messed up or missed or didn't get was what is the image of God? <clears throat> and they didn't have the, you know, why you say, well, why didn't God spell it out for them? You can answer this question easy, right? Why couldn't God spell it out? Why could not God spell it out for them? What was their problem? They didn't have a word for it. 
They didn't have a way of understanding it. They didn't have a cogent or cognitive ability to put that together. And therefore, God told them, I created you out of the earth, and I breathed the flesh into you, just like animals, right? So you are no different as a physical being than really an animal. But we know that, right, from science. But what makes us different than the animals? Because no animal was made in the image of God. Yes, sir. I'm just... This verse also kind of turned on a light bulb idea. Is it also saying that anytime God speaks, that's Christ that's speaking, the speaking part of God, the part of God which, which speaks to us, basically? I'll go even further than that, but your, your comment is beautiful and correct. But think about this. What is, in, well, you may not remember this, but in Hebrew, do you remember what the word is that when it says God created? We, we say God created, but it says in the Hebrew, God amarred. God amarred. God said the command word. In the Septuagint, that is translated as God logos. God spoke the logical argument. So go even further. When Christ utters, what happens? Creation happens. As a matter of fact, and I mentioned this before, the strong force in nature, some Christians, I think quite rightly, may have philosophized that the strong force in nature that holds together the nucleus is Christ. Because if you look at energy, what does it take to hold positrons, protons, together? An incredible force. You know, you think it's hard to put magnets together the wrong way. Think about trying to put protons together, because protons, what happens when I rip them apart? I get I get an atomic bomb. It's called nuclear fission. And when I put them together, what do I get? Nuclear fusion, which is like another even bigger explosion. Okay, dudes, we're, we're talking about when Jesus speaks... I hope you're listening. <laughs> but see, I yeah. Now, John does not have the verbiage, the verbiage, the ability. What he what John is telling us is, you notice the words he uses. He uses remata and lelo. So he's using two different words. One is for a story, but he's saying when God speaks, the utterance, the utterance of God, right, is creation. And I don't think you can divide this. You say, well, you just Digging this up. No, this is, what does he start with? In the beginning, God. And the word, the logos, the logic argument was with God. I don't know. I, I, you, just, you can never separate these things out from one another. And here we go. This means Jesus is filled or entirely spirit. In addition, direct reference to the Nicodemus section about the entire point of sections to convince you about the pneuma of man and the pneuma of God. The argument is that if the pneuma of God exists, the new man must exist because man is made in the image of God. The statement is assumed, doesn't require restating, just referral. But this is a logos. And here we go. The father loves the son, it's placed everything in his hands. You know, you, you could have predicted this as the next logos. So, well, that was a really radical idea for the Jews to be Christians. Yes, it was. It is an incredible radical idea. But <clears throat> from our. <clears throat> Looking back at Genesis, <coughs> does it seem that radical to you? Well, you say it's radical, but because they didn't accept him as the Messiah. But would it have been radical if they thought he was the Messiah? Wouldn't they be more accepting? Uh, I think, I think that number one, if you do not accept the idea of spirit, pneuma in man or mankind can is there can there even be a christ can there even be a messiah well i'm just coming from like they were taught from little that <coughs> it's just stupid right adam the fish yeah and, and they're taught that and they're taught that and they're, so it's ingrained in their culture and whatever for however many thousand years or whatever and now yeah. you got this guy on the scene, John the Baptist and Jesus, and they're like saying something totally. To me, this just rocks that world. 
It does. It rocks their world, and it makes. But I'm surprised I'm, anybody believed them. I'm surprised they didn't stone them. Well, they try. <laughs> they try. <laughs> but but you know you know why they they weren't effective. It's because it's self evident. Well, in our okay, we're Greek thinkers, so in our Greekian worldview, it is self evident that there must be spirit, right? So much so that what is the biggest component of the woke university today? Empiricism, and there is no spirit. There's no spirit, right? There's, okay. there's. I have another thing that just jumped to my brain too. So if Go you're ahead. like listening to Jesus and you're getting all this stuff about, you know, Hagia's Panuma, Panuma, and it's like no longer just okay, I die and go into the ground. So now you're like, well, what happened to all my ancestors? Where are they? What what happened to them? I don't know. I just feel like this just creates a whole lot of questions for that culture. And how I don't know. I don't remember anybody even addressing that kind of issue. Kind of maybe poorly. Well, I think what it's a, when we sleep. It's a beautiful question, and we have the hymn about that, right? Because there there is that big fight too. Well, it is. It's a, it's a Lutheran fight, right? The Lutheran fight, the great Lutheran fight about what happens when you die. Are you immediately with God, or are you in the grave? And do you recognize the fact that you're in the grave? And you're just laying there for a long time, like getting eat up by that worms and stuff. You know, this has been a fight in Christianity, and especially in Lutheranism for a while, because the Catholic view pretty much is: well, when you die, you're immediately with Christ, or hell. <laughs> yeah, you know that there is a bad point. Yeah, you yeah. Know. I mean, purgatory is. Only a place for Christians, like only Christians go there. You eventually get to heaven, but most people have to go through. So pay your way out, right? Get those indulgences <laughs> going. Come on, fill them up. So real quick on the on that thought, though, as far as at that time, um, my what I thought you were saying before, Sadducees didn't believe in the afterlife, but others did, like the Pharisees. Yes. So it may not be. Totally against everything that they understood. There, there were some that didn't agree with that. But it was a physical resurrection. It wasn't a spiritual. Yeah. Well, the other problem you have is you got to write. Okay, uh, we we are talking in terms of black and white and ones and zeros. So if if you're if you're a, a Sadducee, you're kind of like okay, and I'm just going to pick one. Okay, maybe you're like a Baptist minister, right? And you you set to a set of beliefs. And structure that you live your life by. And I'm not picking on the Baptists, I'm just saying, okay, it could be a Lutheran pastor, right? You're a Sadducee, but you're, you know, put that into Lutheran terms. You're, you, if you stray from the path, what happens? You get fired, you lose your, you know, your employment, you lose your, your whatever. So it's, there are reasons why you wouldn't stray from the path. The same thing too if you're a Pharisee. However, we have over 500 years of mysterion. And what does the Greek mysterion teach us? <clears throat> and what were the people doing? What were the Greeks and the, the all the Greeks and Romans we know were involved in mysterions? Those who weren't were just not hip. They weren't part of the real culture, right? For 500 years, they've been involved in mysterions. What about the other Jews? What about the regular guys and gals? What do you think they were involved in? Mysterions. Matter of fact, so much so that Jesus Christ in Matthew, remember Matthew? He said, don't hide your light under a bushel. There's only one reason he would say that. Because he was talking to a lot of people who were doing what? Hiding their light, Hiding their light under literally a bushel. This is Greek, okay? This isn't modern American euphemism. He doesn't mean it as a euphemistic statement. He literally means it. Because in the Mithran worship, and what did most of the Jewish people do? They said, the, the Mithrans came along and said, hey, we're going to have a potluck. You want to come? And they said, yeah, you know, free babysitting, fun times. We get to the Festival of Lights, the Ceremony of Lights. It's in a cave. We get free food. What are you going to do? Go. Go. I'm in. Yeah, yeah. you're going to make a night of it, right? <laughs> and so you get, when they go through, they hit, wait, wait. When we go into our church at Easter, they give us a candle. They don't give us a bushel. But then we light ours in the middle 
And theirs, they covered it with a bushel, and then at the proper point in time, they revealed the light. Okay? And we've traced that down from that, from a Mithrid ritual, to, and it's cool. It, I have no problem with stealing stuff and borrowing stuff from other cultures. This is great. This is part of Christianity. But you got to realize that all these Jewish people, the Jewish people, right, are living in a Mysterion world. And they're Mysterion girls. And they're, they're basically <laughs> absorbing the Mysterion. And the Mysterion is all about the spiritual, right? So, so when Jesus is speaking, who is he, who is he getting... Who's getting his message? Are the Pharisees getting it? Well, he spent a whole night trying to talk to Nicodemus. He was helping Nicodemus. I don't think the Sadducees would have even talked to him because they have no clue, right? They say you die, you die. The Pharisees at least just say there is a resurrection. And Jesus was trying to inform him. But what do you think the regular people thought? There's got to be a spirit. Mysterions, the Greek, the whole thing, right? Everything permeating their culture meant they were ready to hear the message. And, you know, I'm not washing this down. I'm, not, I'm just saying that God himself picks the perfect time to reveal stuff. And I want to, I think there's just a couple more before we get to four. Um, the father loves like the gods, the offspring, and the whole has given in the cherry ahead of him. The Father loves the offspring like the gods and has given everything into his hand. That's pretty straightforward Greek. And that is your telos. Let me see if I have time. Do the last one. Whoever believes in the Son is eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life. And I think that's the last one. 36. Okay. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. He that believes not in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He being persuaded. By logical argument, into the offspring has life perpetual. But he not being persuaded by logical argument into the offspring will not stare at life. Contrawise, the violent passion of God remains against him. That is the Logos to tell us in this whole chapter. This is what Jesus was telling old Nicodemus. This is what Jesus is trying to tell all of us through John in the gospel. John is trying to pronounce this to us. This is a pure. This is your Logos to tell us. Isn't that cool? He actually gave it to us right there at the end. And I know we're out of time. That's it. Thank you, Father, for your word. Pray to look at this future week in your name. Pray. We are out of time next Sunday. Yeah, I announced that, and I think it's marked.